Tonight, Weldon Action has tracked down one of the most elusive men on Earth. This was the end of our search. An ex-cattle boat, the Royal Scotman, docked at Bizerta, a small port in North Africa. On board, about 250 people, making some sort of a crew, and this mysterious man. The localized scream man thought he was a great scientist looking for insects. Everybody seems to think he's a millionaire. These are no ordinary seamen. Their allegiance and devotion to the mysterious man is total. To them, he is my Commodore. The man is L. Ron Hubbard, charmer, science fiction writer and showman, the creator of Scientology and the man who's pushing it into its new, more militant phase. He now requires that his crew must have training in judo and weaponry and that they must be ethically beyond reproach, tough, formidable and effective. To them, he's a savior. One of them wrote, that which I have really found is the nearness to the greatness which is Ron, our founder, to me, above all, my Commodore. Today, shyness has overcome Mr. Hubbard when asked to appear on television. After several weeks of hunting for him with the help of almost every radio station along the Mediterranean and beyond, Weldon Action at last tracked Hubbard down. Just before dawn, on a recent Sunday morning, Hubbard, who finds sleeping difficult, decided at last to speak. He spoke for a long, long time about his money, his beliefs, his critics, and the new authoritarian structure of Scientology. But first he spoke about his troubles with the British government. He put on his hat, he smiled, and he began. Well, <clears throat> that's very interesting. But let's correct an impression first. You said you were in trouble. Let's get my relationship to this completely straight. So on. I am the writer of the textbooks of Scientology. About two and a half years ago or so, I even ceased to be a director of organizations. The government, in the first place, I am not in trouble with the British government, not even faintly, and if I went in today or tomorrow through immigration, they would tip their hats and say, how are you, Mr. Hubbard, as they have been doing for years. The immigration officials might well tip their hats, but they couldn't let him in. The day we filmed Mr. Hubbard, the Home Office decided that Britain would be better off without him. St. Hill Manor, England, Hubbard's British headquarters, handling an income of something like one million pounds a year. But as Scientology expands, more and more governments and mental health authorities condemn it. I wondered, Mr. Hubbard, if you could explain simply to a layman what Scientology is. I think that'd be a relatively easy idea because it's actually a subject which is designed for the layman. And if you couldn't explain it to the layman, you would have a very difficult time of it. The subject of name means skio, which means knowing how to know in the fullest sense of the word, ology, which is study of. So it is actually study of knowingness. That is what the word itself means. The to subject... Me, yeah. To me, that doesn't mean very much. I didn't understand that. I mean, what does it do for you, in theory? It increases one's knowingness. But if a man were totally aware of what was going on around him, he would find it relatively simple to handle any outnesses in that. Even after three hours of talking, we never got an explanation from him that we could understand. In fact, Scientology is a faith, a religion. Because faiths are now out of fashion, it calls itself a science. But scientists would have just as much difficulty with the beliefs of Scientology as they do with virgin births and resurrections from the dead. St. Hill is a nice place. Scientologists are very friendly and honestly believe that they can help whoever goes to them. Usually, they can. Scientologists do two basic things. First, they sit for hours listening to recordings of Hubbard and they're examined to see how well they've learnt it. Now, the mind, when it has an old experience, will add that data into its current experience, and it keeps coming up with wrong answers. A professor looks at some college student uh, with a slight uh, twitch of the uh, uh, eye, and this girl says, he has winked at me. 
He just got in his eye at that minute, you see. What he tells them, when you cut through the jargon, is partly good sense, teaching his disciples how to calm down and deal with the things that worry them. The rest is religious ramblings and stories about his achievements in this life and the ones he's led before, which are as imaginative as his science fiction. Because she was assaulted when she was ten by a fellow who winked at her first. And it messed her up considerably. Is correct? I don't understand what old crunches are. Old crunches, they're a, uh, they're a thing. <laughs> the real hooker in Scientology is this instrument. They call it an e-meter. It's a very simple electronic device that's been around for years as a lie detector. There's no mystery whatsoever about it. Hubbard uses it in a process he calls auditing, the Scientologist's confessional. Here, the student talks, often for many hundreds of expensive hours, about himself. His inmost secrets are dug into. As they question, embarrassment, fear, guilt, shame, any emotion will make the needle waver. American courts have condemned the e-meter as being totally unscientific. It measures only emotion. It can't distinguish between fantasy and reality. If you feel ashamed because you believe that in a previous incarnation you hammered the nails into Christ's feet, the Scientologists think that proves that you lived before as a Roman centurion. Unburdened, the student feels free at last. It's this area that's of deepest concern to the medical world. Although discussing their deepest problems naturally makes many people feel better, the Scientologists also apply this technique to people in no fit mental state to stand it. Sometimes, digging with the best will in the world into a student's problems, they can reduce him to a state of collapse well known to psychiatrists. The Scientologists gaily call it the sad effect. The only mystery about the e-meter is its price. In a recent U.S. income tax trial, it was stated that it cost about four pounds nine shillings to make, while Hubbard was selling it for between 44 and 51 pounds. As the court commissioner said, such profitability, while not at all conclusive, is indicative of a commercial operation. The Hubbard College of Scientology Qualifications Division, Department of Certifications and Awards, does hereby certify that Janet E. Lundy has attained the state of clear. This girl has reached her goal. She has gone clear. Clears, like her, have gone through a list of some 60 questions written in Hubbard's own handwriting without showing any emotional reaction on the e-meter to any of them. Towards us, the unbelievers, they feel pity. They call us wogs. I've never given a speech before, so this is the first one for me. But I did want to say one thing. Uh, validate yourselves. You're beautiful. Thank you. For many, Scientology becomes not only a faith, but a way of life. They become dependent upon the organization for their social life and even their livelihood. They work for very long hours and almost no money. A year ago, the organization did not deny a profit of half a million pounds. Since then, the income has touched 30,000 pounds a week. They neither know nor care what happens to the money. About three years ago, Hubbard introduced a new note into his little kingdom, discipline. He laid down a rigid line of conduct. Since then, the ethics department has taken over more and more. This is one of Hubbard's ethics orders on critics of Scientology, so-called suppressives. SP order, fair game, may be deprived of property or injured by any means by any Scientologist without any discipline of the Scientologist, may be tricked, sued or lied to, or destroyed. Last year, Hubbard wrote, Now get this as a technical fact, not a hopeful idea. Every time we have investigated the background of a critic of Scientology, we have found crimes for which that person or group could be imprisoned under existing law. We do not find critics of Scientology who do not have criminal pasts. Over and over we prove this. Politician A stands up on his hind legs in a parliament and brays for a condemnation of Scientology. When we look him over, we find crimes, embezzled funds, moral lapses, a thirst for young boys, sordid stuff. Wife B howls at her husband for attending a Scientology group. We look her up and find she had a baby he didn't know about. Most recently, Hubbard wrote this of a group of people who defended against the ethics department. They are declared enemies of mankind, the planet, and all life. They are fair game. No amnesty may ever cover them. The Criminals Prosecution Bureau is to find any and all crimes in their pasts and have them brought to court and a prison. 
Any Sea Organization member contacting any of them is to use auditing process R245. Hubbard calls R245 an enormously effective process of exteriorization frowned upon by society at this time. But it's here, back on the ship with Hubbard, that ethics really flourish. The stated purpose of the ship is to get ethics in. Hubbard is captain. On the ship, he's not governed by English law. But we asked him about his authoritarian activities at his English headquarters. If there is an authoritarian structure at St. Hill, it has been brought into being by the government itself. St. Hill is trying to correct itself. It doesn't know what it's trying to correct because nobody has told it what to correct. We get these odd allegations we used to in the old days, and I'm sure they still do. And all I'd have to do, all Robinson would have to do is say, you fellows mustn't do so-and-so, and you must do so-and-so. And immediately these fellows would straighten out. Uh, as it is, yeah, listen, they're surely. trying to prevent Scientologists from doing something wrong, but they don't know what would be wrong. But Britain, we hope, is not an authoritarian place. It does not say to people, you will now stop doing this, you will now start doing that. And that is what your organization does. And some people find that helpful. They're told by you. And I'm sure you can do it very well. Not by me. Not by me. The ship's company right now. They uh, think they're told by you. That's say tale. Uh, and they feel that you are a strength for them in that way. Anybody who has inspired a movement would be a strength for them. But let me, let me clarify this very definitely. It is not an authoritarian organization, and the only reason why it is trying desperately to keep itself in some sort of very firm order and so on is because they're trying to correct things. But surely it's authoritarian in its treatment of suppressive people, that kind of thing. I mean, you don't allow criticism. Oh, no, a suppressive person isn't critical. A suppressive person is a person who denies the right of others. But surely you are doing precisely that thing to them by denying them the right to do what they want to Perhaps, do. Perhaps, but if somebody is going to kill a baby, I think you would deny him the right to. This is beside the point. The only thing, the only reason why any discipline has had to enter the scene and the government should be very glad of that discipline, is to keep the lunatic fringe and from other people from exploiting this subject and victimizing people with it. If the government were to knock out the control point of Scientology, they would reap the whirlwind. Why do they just fight it and say there's something bad? But they never specify what's bad. They haven't specified. For instance, right now they say we're breaking up marriages. All right, that's a lie. As a matter of fact, they're saying that at the moment when you've got this book which was just about to go on the press, is How to Save Your Marriage, because it contains thousands of successful marriages. How many times have you been married? How many times have I been married? I've been married twice. And I'm very happily married just now. I have a lovely wife, and I have four children. My first wife is dead. What happened to your second wife? I never had a second wife. What Hubbard said happens to be untrue. It's an unimportant detail, but he's had three wives. He did have a second wife, Sarah Northrop Hubbard, from whom he was divorced on the 12th of June, 1951. He has at least three other children. What is important is that his followers were there as he lied. But no matter what the evidence, they don't believe it. Nick Robinson was on that ship until June this year as director of public activity. How do Scientologists react when it's proved to them that Hubbard claims things in his past that just aren't true? Well, it depends, depends how high up they are. Obviously, you can shake a pretty new Scientologist that way. But if they've been in Scientology a long time, they, they don't think in other terms, you know. Scientology is their universe, and so they would just refuse to believe it. What are you actually doing on this ship now? I am studying ancient civilizations, trying to find what happened to them, finding out why they went into a decline, why they died, the studying, I mean, what do you do? How do you do it? I have sent out several people to look over areas and so on. They come back, they tell me what they are. I go out to the important ones. Well, the way Hubbard did his research, so far as we could see, uh, was to scout around um, the, the islands and the coastline of the Mediterranean and um, see what it suggested to him, you see. Uh, he 
uh, so it was supposed to, ha uh, to have total recall of past life. This past life thing goes right through Scientology. So it's a pretty important thing to establish, you know. And one incident which he described at the party following his return was that he had docked at Sardinia. And uh, 2,000 years ago, according to him, he had been the commander of a fleet of war galleys in the Mediterranean. And he had had an affair with the priestess of the temple on Sardinia. And he used to make assignations with her by a secret tunnel into the temple. It was all beautiful Ryder Haggard stuff. And, uh, well, at the island, he made a little passive model of the secret entrance and sent his troops around, his scouts around for it. And there it was, lo and behold, uh, there was a stone which resembled the, the model. And uh, they thought, well, this is the entrance. And when Hubbard described this at the party, uh, celebrating his return, you know, the whole room sort of erupted into cries of good old Ron and, and the whistles, you know. And I think I was the only one there, uh, kind of skirting at the banquet, you know, who thought, well, this is marvelous showmanship, but it doesn't prove a damn thing about past life. Do you believe that you have lived before? Now, to answer that question is to be very unfair. Scientologists believe they lived before, though, don't they? Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, it's quite interesting that exercises can be conducted which demonstrate conclusively that there are memories which exist prior to this life. These are some of the faithful at fire drill one of the few things we were able to film before they got angry. One crew member wrote a letter published in the ship's magazine. My body was seen in the ship at a certain place, whereas at the very time it was being seen, I was discussing the very spot with another three sea organization members way away from where I was seen. After this, I received three letters from South Africa, the writers of which were glad having seen me and congratulated me on looking so well. My last time in South Africa was 1957, Recently, I went there four times, bodiless, to see my friend, Chris Feidemann. My body has not left Spain since it got here. Not everybody on board was so fortunate. Nick Robinson. For a long time, I was um, noticing discrepancies between what Hubbard was claiming to be the abilities of his clears and OTs and what I knew were their abilities, because I'd met several hundred of these clears uh, and several OTs, which are the advanced students, and they just didn't have the abilities Hubbard said they had. Uh, he published uh, some years ago that uh, a clear would have a genius IQ, would have total recall, that it's perfect memory, would have excellent health, high ethics, and would never have accidents by his own fault. Now, I found incidents to refute every single one of those claims. In fact, I never found a clear who lives up to the entire formula. So, uh, I thought if Hubbard could exaggerate here, well, other areas he could also exaggerate. I went down to, science, to Valencia to check out these OTs, who were there on math, and I wasn't impressed at all, so I left. Those who stay provide Hubbard with an almost free crew. There are no professional sailors. He pays them just enough for cigarettes and sweets, but they pay him rather more. The new advanced courses cost something more than £1,000 plus keep, payable to an account in the name of Hubbard's present wife. If all 250 people have signed for these advanced courses, which according to Hubbard can be completed in weeks, days, and even hours, that makes over a quarter of a million pounds. The scrapers could be scraping for quite some time. They've been asked to sign a contract for one billion years. You say that you have retired from Scientology. You're now on a very smart and splendidious ship. Well, what are you doing on this ship? I don't think the labor government ought to know this because they don't approve of loafing, but I'm loafing. What are you just loafing on? on? On what proceeds? Where did you get all the money to loaf? Well, one tends to overlook the fact that all during the 30s and actually during the late 40s, I was a highly successful writer and that a great many properties and so on accumulated during that period of time. Is that really where the money for all this comes from? Yes, yes. One of the things... It doesn't come from the Scientologists at St. Hill. No, the Scientologists at St. Hill... As a matter of fact, I wish I had the bill here to show you. But we added up over the years what monies I had loaned organizations and what monies of mine, personally, 
royalties and so on had been collected by Scientology organizations and the amount of money paid out for research, and it amounts to $13 million. That's a fantastic sum of money. Because the other thing that we hear about are things like Swiss bank accounts, the Pique Bank, that kind of thing. And there's a great temptation to believe that your yacht and the standard of life to which you are now accustomed is paid for by Scientologists in England. The amounts of money in Switzerland are minimal. Very small amount of money in Switzerland. Why do you have Swiss bank accounts? I don't have Swiss bank accounts. There is a, there is a bank account in Switzerland. I don't know how much money is in it, but not very much. The amount of money uh, which comes to me at this time is mostly capital because I don't take any income. These days, in days of income tax, it's almost impossible to take any income. So your capital, that did come from the Scientologists? No. No, the Scientologists and so on, actually, it's what I tell you is quite true. Yes, but uh, the only problem I have with that sum is you haven't told me where the money does come from where the obviously very large sums of money that you have. Well, there were very, very large sums of money that I made when I was very young. Fifteen million published words and a great many successful movies don't make nothing. Hubbard's finances are almost impossible to unravel, but in the pre-boom days of Scientology from 55 to 59, he and his immediate family got at least $154,971, plus a percentage, usually 10, of the gross income of all other Scientology organizations. If he still gets 10% from St. Hill alone, that's roughly £100,000 a year. And he doesn't deny selling his name to the organization for £100,000, but says he never got the money. Well, people don't talk about how Hubbard gets his money. You know, uh, they all assume that the, the, the handouts tell them that he used to be a millionaire himself before Scientology. And uh, it's not an area which it's safe, really, to look into. Hubbard uh, claims that he is well out of Scientology. Was that your impression? He really is in charge all the, all the way. And he receives telexes every day from his organizations all over the world, especially St. Hill in England. And he sends telexes to St. Hill, uh, giving them instructions and so on. So he really is involved. Don't you wake up sometimes in the middle of the night and think to yourself, well, I've been on this ship with a whole lot of Scientologists who believe I'm fantastic. I've been here for a whole year and not seen anybody else, and I wish to hell I could go away from them. <laughs> well, I haven't been here a whole year, you know. Uh, I've been out associating with Arabs and all kinds of people. And one of the ways you learn about life is to associate with people. And, uh, but you don't. You only associate with Scientologists. Perfectly happy to associate with anybody. The whole point about it is, is they don't believe I'm fantastic. If you saw the number of <laughs> times they don't follow my orders. <laughs> well, they probably disobey his orders in the seal because a lot of the crew so far have been completely incompetent. They haven't been able to obey his orders. And so we've had accidents and so on due to that. But uh, on board the ship, he's a kind of Jesus Christ come Buddha. You know, all rolled into one. Uh, I mean, his busts and photographs are everywhere. He, you know, he just is God. You say that Scientology is a science. Now, it seems to me that Scientologists believe quite a lot of things which would be scientifically unacceptable, and that therefore Scientology isn't a science at all. It's a faith, like flying saucers are a faith. <laughs> A science is something which is constructed from truth on workable axioms. There are 55 axioms in Scientology which are very demonstrably true. And on these can be constructed a great deal. But there are also a lot of things that aren't true. Not necessarily aren't true, but aren't usual. They found something that works, you know, in a, a kind of psychological wilderness elsewhere. And um, they've also been fired with a tremendous ambition because there's nothing too ambitious for Scientology that they seriously hope to eventually take over the galaxy. You think that you're okay, huh? Well, I don't know that I'm okay any more than anybody else is okay, but I at least live a happy life and a very full one. I have a 
happy marriage, and my kids are all cheerful, and I'm not, any, nobody's finding any fault with me, personally. Do you ever think that you might be quite mad? Oh, yes. The one man in the world who never believes he's mad is a madman. <laughs>